thrilled that you're here today. And for those that are watching online, we're thrilled that you're tuned in today. And uh, we're in a series in the book of Acts. And what we're talking about in this series is being the church, not just going to a church, not just watching a church, not just attending a church, but to actually be the church. And you've heard me say this, I think, every week. Um, it is highly likely that you can get bored with going to church, but it is almost impossible to become bored with being the church. And we're called to be the church, not just go to a facility. So we're in Acts chapter 3. We're about going through a chapter a week in the book of Acts. So how many knows where we'll be next week? Acts chapter 4, that's right. So Acts 3, one day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at 3 in the afternoon. Now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John, and then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver or gold, I do not have, but what I do have I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk, and then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. And when all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. While the man held on to Peter and John, all the people were astonished and came running to them in the place called Solomon's Colonnade. When Peter saw this, he said to them, Fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. You handed him over to be killed, and you disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. You disowned the holy and righteous one and asked that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know has been made strong. It is Jesus' name and faith that comes through him that has completely healed him as you can all see. Uh, this text is the first recorded miracle performed by the apostles following Jesus' death, resurrection, and ascension. We know from Acts, the second chapter, in the 43rd verse, it tells us that there were many signs and wonders that were done by the apostles. So there were lots of miracles that were occurring. So when only one miracle is listed, it's not just to say this is something that happened, but it's giving us insight into the kinds of things that God was doing in the group of people who were following Jesus. So this miracle illustrates. And anytime we talk about miracles, and, and I would guess that all of us would like to see more miracles in our life, often what we think of in that term is, how can I learn to leverage whatever I can to get more from God? This message is not about how to twist God's arm. This message is about how to open our hearts to what God wants to do among us. So Peter and John are on their way, a way to prayer. And uh, this is uh, really interesting. Uh, on the way to prayer, they have something that they're going to wind up giving. Um, I think a lot of us can often come to the conclusion that the reason we go to church is for something that we can receive. Wouldn't it be great if we could come to church willing to receive, but also willing to be able to share with others what God gives us to share? 
Uh, back in that day, it was believed that if a person gave something to the poor on the way to the temple, that that pleased God and you were more likely to get your prayers answered. By the way, people still do things like this today. They'll, they'll try to stack the deck in their favor to get God to do something for them. Um, this man is suffering. He's begging. This is an uncomfortable thing to witness if you've ever seen it. Uh, I think that there are lots of things that we don't like in our world, and the good news is that none of them are in heaven. There is no disease, there is no poverty, there is no separation, there is no grief. Um, heaven is a great place just for what's not there, but then there's a bunch of stuff that makes it great for what is there. So a miracle occurs here, and miracles actually are important because they remind us they remind us of God's order of things, not just the world's disorder of things. That in heaven, it looks different than it does here. So talking about miracles is a very uncomfortable topic because there are people that one of the first questions they will ask is, so if God can do miracles and God can heal, then why doesn't God just eliminate all suffering, right? Fair question. And what I want you to know is, is that he is at work doing exactly that, and eventually all suffering will be eliminated. He is doing that. But there are other reasons that we become uncomfortable for talking about miracles too. We're not sure that we'd like to believe that the rules and the laws of nature can be overruled and overridden. For a lot of people, they really don't think that God has any more options than they do. Uh, a lot of people really struggle to believe in God, period, much less a God that can do miracles, and it's because they can't imagine that anyone or anything can do anything else than what they're able to do. And so there's a, some other things that make us uncomfortable with miracles. And uh, when we see suffering and we want to see a miracle, I'm sure you've prayed for one. I've prayed for lots of them. And I've seen God do some remarkable things. And there's times when it didn't happen the way that I wanted it to. And, and the great challenge for us is when God doesn't do a miracle, the kinds of questions that follow up after that will say things like, I wonder if there's something wrong with me. Maybe I'm not good enough which is one of the first things that Peter addresses. He said, you don't really think that this man was healed because of our power or our goodness. But we think like this. Sometimes we think that the pain that has come into our life or the lost opportunity in our life is actually a punishment from God. And so when it comes to the subject of miracles, it's just way safer and a lot less emotional to back away from it. And it's why large parts of the Christian faith are just not as interested in a conversation about it. Though in the deepest parts of their heart, they always hope that something of God's kingdom will break through into their lives. I also think that we don't want to appear naive or foolish. I mean, isn't it just foolish people, just kind of uneducated people, just naive people who believe in miracles? And so once again, we're not here to twist God's arm this morning but we are here to open our hearts and our minds to learn something about how God works. So I think we, have, uh, I, I, we all have assumptions about things, right? Um, if you didn't know, we planned a water baptism today, and, and thanks to COVID, we planned it outside, and when we planned it, we assumed we would have a decent weather day. That did not happen, and so now we plan that next Sunday will be a decent weather day. If you want to start praying about that now, maybe God will give us a miracle, and that would be great. But we have a set of assumptions, and we, our assumptions tend to limit our participation in a miracle. For example, you know, my need is just really too small for God to pay any attention to. Or I'm not really a good enough or a holy enough or a famous enough or an influential enough person for God to do anything. And I would say that a lot of us have assumptions that keep us from participating in what God would like to do in our lives. So I would like to give us four assumptions today that will help us participate in what God wants to do. And the first assumption is this. Assume we, you don't know all you need 
or when you need it. Assume you don't know all that you need or when you need it. It's the biggest problem with miracles is uh, timing. We just want it to happen by this date. And, uh, and God really isn't as influenced by our calendar as he is by his agenda. So God sees beneath the surface of a lot of our lives and, and he knows what's going on. He, he sees beyond our wishes and our desires and our dreams. And he actually sees needs. We know from the next chapter in Acts that this man was actually over 40 years old and he had been born with this condition. He had literally at over 40 years never taken a single step in his life. In the ancient world, begging is considered a profession. It's a kind of work. And so if you can't do other kinds of work, then this is the kind of work that you do. And you try to strategically locate yourself in a place where you are likely to receive some generosity and benevolence from people who are passing by. So what is this man asking for? He's asking for money. What does he believe he needs? He believes he needs money. He's not able to do other things, so this is how he supports himself. And what's interesting is that he's, while he's a very broken play, man, he's in a very beautiful place. He's at a gate that had a nickname, and the nickname is, that's the beautiful gate. It's a beautiful place. What's interesting to me about this is that often when we feel broken, our tendency is to withdraw from places that are beautiful. When we feel like we have less, we tend to withdraw from places that feel like there is more. We don't like to be reminded of what's not working in our life. And here's what I want you to hear from me this morning. You will never find out what is possible by staying away as far as possible. Your keeping your distance does not make you any closer to a miracle. It eliminates your participation in what God wants to do in your life. So once again, people believe God gave special attention to, to uh, any benevolence that was offered on the way to the temple. So that's why he's here. And Peter and John are going in and it's at the hour of prayer. There are actually two of them that were listed in the church calendars those days, one at nine in the morning and one at three in the afternoon. And so now they're going to give something rather than just receive something. And, and the system is not something you've earned. Peter and John haven't given, they haven't even made it to the temple yet. They haven't dropped anything in the offering. They haven't done anything, which means that they're not paying for what's about to happen. Somebody else paid for what's about to happen. Isaiah 53 tells us that Jesus is the one who was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities, that the punishment of our peace was upon him and by his stripes we are healed. We're not in a barter system. If I do this, God will do that. We're in a grace system where God doesn't do things because we are good. God does things because he is good. That's a good place for an amen, don't you think? I mean, that's just an amazing thing about God. So, so we assume that the, it, it is a good assumption that the God who paid all the price knows all that we need. And uh, I, th I think our tendency is to imagine things that, that well, let, let me put it this way. Has anybody ever played this game? If I got a million dollars, what would I do with it? Just me. <laughs> I play this game frequently. I want to be prepared just in case it happens. And uh, you, I've told you this, that when I drive by the 490 and the mega million numbers are up on the billboard and it tells, you know, is it like 95 last, 95 million dollars, 95 million dollars. And, and I tell God, if you ever give me the numbers, I'll make you proud. I will. <laughs> and I got a plan. I got a plan for what to do with whatever that number is on that. And here's the thing. We have more imagination for what we don't have than we have for what we do have. We don't know what to do with what we've got, but we assume we can do a lot more. So second assumption, assume your limitations are actually opportunities. Peter and, and John didn't have any money, so it would be easy to say, there's nothing I can do here. But the Holy Spirit prompted Peter to take an action. We often assume that if I don't have what the person is asking for, I don't have anything to offer that will help. Don't just listen to the request of an individual. Listen to the prompting of the Holy Spirit. 
And, and, and Peter acknowledges. I mean, if you've ever been without money, it's not an easy thing to acknowledge. If you've ever had to ask someone for something to kind of carry you over for another day or two, it's not an easy thing to do. And, and, and Peter's not just lying so he doesn't have to extend any money. He's, it's honest. I, I don't have any money. That's a humbling thing to admit to someone. It would be better not to say anything at all, avert your eyes and just keep moving forward. But he doesn't. He acknowledges I don't have any money. That's kind of a humble thing to do. And here's what you should know about God. God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And if you humble yourself under God's hand, he will lift you up. Your struggle does not limit access to God. It amplifies it if you're willing to acknowledge it. And Peter just does that. God's kingdom has resources that aren't as valued as the resources of our world. Our, value, our world values things like money and power and access and popularity and influence and attention. And the assumption is if I have those things, then I can make a real difference in this world. What I can tell you is there's lots of people who have exactly that, and they all believe that. So how are they doing? Does this world look like heaven to you? There are other resources that we need to value that actually make a difference in our world. Resources like humility, because humility is the key to learning. When you think you know it all and you think you have all that you need, you can't receive and you can't learn anything. But when you're humble, a whole universe opens up to you. Availability is the key to going through the door that is actually open instead of making yourself unavailable because you don't like that door. You don't think that it's the right time for you. The key, the, the value of serving, because serving is how you actually make a difference in the world. And by the way, feel like you did something that mattered. Faithfulness is the key to restoration. Our world right now will cut someone off at the knees for anything that they've said or done. And that becomes a life sentence. And people who could be restored aren't restored because we don't know how to be faithful anymore, but that's a value of heaven and, and honesty is the key to strength and freedom. It's a hard thing to say something that's a true thing, but what I will tell you is every time we don't say a true thing, something in us gets weaker. You speak the truth because this is what you know. When you are honest, that's what brings life and that's what brings freedom and that's what brings strength. And hope is a value of heaven because it's the key to stamina. If you want to keep going, you're going to need some hope. Generosity is the key to your heart. Our assumption is, is that I will give when I feel like I really have a connection with something. Here's the secret from heaven's side. When you invest in something, your heart begins to care about something. That's how it works. I d don't raise your hand because I don't want to get anybody in trouble today. But do you believe in love at first sight? Don't raise your hand. Because if you're sitting next to someone and you don't raise your hand, then they're going to wonder exactly how long did that take. And what I will tell you is sometimes that infatuation piece is right there really fast. And sometimes it takes a while. And this is what I've discovered is that uh, we don't just walk up to strangers on the street and say, will you marry me? You can try that. And the only thing I can say is if someone says yes, you won't like how that turns out. <laughs> so what do people do? They want to get to know each other better. So they'll invest time and, and they'll go to different places and they'll observe different things and they'll have conversations and they keep investing in and investing in and their hearts keep getting closer to closer to each other until they sometimes want to make a lifetime commitment and then they get married and then they don't date anymore and they don't invest anymore and they don't talk anymore. And then they say, I, I, I just fell out of love. No, you didn't. You stopped investing. Your heart, that's how our heart changes. It's on our investment. These are values of the kingdom. And so... Assume your limitations, the things that you don't have, are actually opportunities for things that God wants to do. Third assumption, assume you don't know all that is possible. You don't know 
all that is possible. Uh, this man looked to them, expecting to get some money, and then Peter tells him, we don't have any money. So the question I have for you is, what are you expecting? Because a lot of times we do the math in our heads and we run the trajectory out as far as we can see it and we go, yeah, nothing's going to happen, nothing's going to change. And in an attempt to protect ourselves from disappointment and discouragement, we, we abort whatever path that it is we are on. We can trust in God. Please hear this. Trust is how you connect to something that you can't see yet. That's, that's how trust works. If all you can do is act on what you can see, you're going to miss out on a lot of life. God gave us this capacity to trust because something is possible that you can't see yet. And so this man looks. He's expecting to get something. Don't allow what you see to discourage and to distract you. Assume you don't know everything that's possible. Maybe God has something for you you haven't seen or heard about yet. Fourth assumption that will help you participate in a miracle. Assume miracles will complicate your life in ways it should be complicated. So, oh, I, I, I don't like com a complicated life, Pastor. You should know this. If you're coming to God asking him to give you an easy life, God never promised you an easy life. He promised you a full life, and I promise you there's a world of difference between those two things. Any parents in the room with kids? Full life. Not easy life. Parenting is not easy. Um, when we... When we come to God and we're asking him to intervene in our lives, it's going to complicate this man's life, right? Now, instead of the profession of begging, he's going to have to go learn some other kind of skill and find another opportunity and do that six days a week in order to take care of himself just like he was before. This is going to complicate his life. By the way, the church is about to grow through all of this, and a growing church creates complications, just logistically, and, and timing issues, and investment issues, and resource allocation issues. I mean, it, it gets very, very complicated, and this is what we should know. God has come to complicate our lives in ways it should be complicated. Sin will always complicate our lives in ways it should not be complicated. So here's the question that I have for you. In what way, in what way are you paralyzed and unable to walk? Well, Pastor, I can walk just fine. Okay, just think about this with me for a second, okay? There's likely to be an area in your life that when opportunity comes up, you never consider it seriously because you say things like, that's not who I am. That's not how I was raised. That's not the kind of person that I am. And there's something inside of you that keeps you from walking into the rooms that's possible, that God has opened up doors for, because there's something that's laying in you. So I'm going to ask the worship team to come out. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads right now. And this is what I'm going to ask you to do. I want you to think through, is there an area that you feel laying in? For some of you, it might just be uh, just friendships and relationships. Like, it seems so much harder for you than someone else, and you've actually learned not to open yourself up so that you're not hurt. And you've actually said things to yourself, like, that's just not who I am. It's easy for other people, not for me. And you're lame. You're not able to walk into those opportunities. For some of you, it might be just an emotional thing. The, the clouds and the fog of a kind of series of thoughts are a constant battle for you. And you see hope 
as something that's just going to destroy you because if it doesn't come through, there won't be nothing left of me. And I'm not trying to be unkind, but that's a kind of lameness. It'll keep you from beautiful places and strong people because you just feel devalued when you're around them. Maybe for you it's a, it's a financial thing. I don't have the education, I don't have the opportunity, I don't have the look that when I go into some rooms, I can't get past first impressions. And so you just, you don't walk in any of those directions anymore. You're just, you're lame. You're actually hoping somebody sees you where you are and has some kind of benevolent action for you instead of the hope that you can walk into a situation God has created for you. Or maybe it's a physical thing. There's a thousand ways, a thousand ways we can be lame. And what I want you to know is that the Holy Spirit is here today. And if we will change our assumptions, we might be able to participate in a miracle. In just a moment, in just a moment, I'm gonna have us all stand to sing. But when we stand to sing, this is what I want us to think. I want us to realize that in that moment, what we're hearing the Holy Spirit say to us is rise up and walk into the very things you think are impossible for you. Walk into them because the Holy Spirit is making it possible today. Heavenly Father, wherever our lameness is in our life, would you help us hear your spirit today? And would you help us stand and walk into all that you have for us in Jesus' name? And everyone who agreed with that prayer said, amen. Let's all stand this morning. Let's all lift our voice. Let's walk into the future God has for us.